you're probably watching this video because one, you're looking to upgrade your mount. You don't know which one you want to pick. So let's talk today about the Sim 70 that has the eye puller built into it and allows you to carry as much as 70 pounds of payload. Observatory grade mount with again, the built-in eye puller scope. How does this Sim 70 fare though? So today we're gonna to look at this particular telescope holistically. Full disclosure, Ioptron did not send me this mount to review. I used my own money to purchase this mount. It hasn't been a year, it's only been a, a few months now, but I've put a number of different telescopes on it, including my 10 inch Newtonian and C11 telescopes, which weigh in excess of 44 pounds. I think they were both about 45 pounds when fully loaded, or about 20 kilograms. Once I put on my mini PC, um, you know, the, the camera, the off-axis guider, the filter wheel, coma correctors, reducers, all of that together, about 45 pounds. And I put it on this very mount right here. And I did all of that while staying under this mount's full capacity. When you first look at this mount out of the case, it's beautiful. It's very heavy duty material. It is complete metal. Um, this matte black look is absolutely awesome because I personally don't like my mount to be visible at night um, because I put it out in the backyard. Now, some people like their mount to be very visible because they take it everywhere they go, but I like mine to kind of blend into its surroundings. I have all black telescopes. I still have an all black mount too. So let's take a quick look at this. So when I unlock the declination access, you can see here we have a port plug in here. You have your DC 12 volt here. You have three USB 2.0s, and then you have two additional 12 volt three amp plugins here. Now I personally use these two plugins and that's pretty much it, but you do have these options up here and we'll talk a little bit more about each of these. Up here we have the lock and unlock key for the RA access. Now I will caution you, this is somewhat heavy, so make sure you have a good grip if you go to unlock it because it will wanna fall one way or another if you don't have that counterweight on. So when you first get your mount, this hex key will be located right here in this slot. Now, once you've removed it from the slot here, a lot of people online express that they didn't know where to put this, right? Because you wanna store this, you don't want it to just be out in the middle of nowhere. So right down here, there's a little hole. It slides all the way right in and it'll stay right there. Now, if you are transporting this, you can go ahead and put it back in and leave it there just to lock that access. And then that way you don't have to worry about that key getting lost. Now, you do mount the head to your tripeer or the tripod right through here. There's a little hole right here. And then there is a key, a screw that you have to turn. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's the location here. You of course have your knobs for turning the RA axis here to get your alignment. Down in this panel here, you can see you've got your 12 volt in. This is gonna be the power to the mount. Your on off switch followed by the ST4 your USB to plug it into your computer, and your HBX, which is gonna be for your hand controller. Now, one thing that this mount does not get enough credit for is going to be the fact that if you look right up here, you'll notice right here, there's some numbers in there. Let's say you're doing your polar alignment and you are being told that you are two degrees to the left, so you need to go right. Look at this, as you turn, the mount will actually give you a rough indicator of how far to turn to acquire that two degrees. So I do love this. This does not get enough credit in my books. I wish every mount did this. Just give you the options to see how far you need to turn. Right up here, you can see you have your eye puller plug-in and then another DCN. And now we'll talk about this DCN versus this DCN um, here momentarily. So these would be the main features of this particular scope. Um, all you have to do here is simply unscrew this cap. And that will open up the iPolar scope here. And you can see that it's actually a decent sized camera. So let's talk about the features themselves and tell you what, I'm actually going to step out of this shot and I'm gonna just let those features scroll right through here. Now you can look at all of the features, but there's always gonna be those couple of key things that you wanna look for. Now, initially, my reason for picking this was the 31.8 kilogram or 70 pound 
payload capacity, plus it only weighs 30 pounds. Now, I do also thoroughly love the alt azimuth dials. Um, the precision of 0 0.07 arc seconds accuracy um, is actually pretty darn close, right? If it's not that, it's going to be really close to it from my experience. One of the key things to look at is the PE or the periodic error. Now it's reported as plus or minus about three and a half arc seconds uh, periodic error. I don't personally use this unguided, but I do find that if I go any faster than a two and a half second exposure, this will try to overcorrect too much and your guiding will actually go worse than if you leave it at two and a half to three seconds exposures with your guide camera. Now I do know I've used this for lunar and planetary viewing. And as long as you are relatively close to polar aligned, I just used the eye polar and I was able to align and get my little circle to turn green with an eye polar software. And when you look at the moon or the planets, they never leave your field of view. You are always tracking them really well. So if there is error from a visual standpoint, you're not going to notice it. From an astrophotography standpoint, yeah, that's incredibly noticeable. But with guiding at that point, I do find it does well. Now, I have tried a couple different exposures. At about two minutes is when my stars would start to trail. Now, I did try multiple exposure lengths. And what I did was 30 second incremental increases until I got to about two minutes. Once I got to two and a half minutes, my stars begin to really have trails. So somewhere between two and two and a half minutes, I find that this mount's accuracy does start to show that it does have some error built into it. But that's all mounts, right? If you're talking about this mount or any mount in this particular price range, they're all gonna have the same problems. So the fact that you can actually do PPEC or permanent periodic error correction, especially with visual, will really help. Now, I didn't feel I even needed to do this because I was always guiding. If you're unguided doing your exposures, doing PPEC will also help you might be able to get three minute exposures with that, maybe even more. Now, if you are buying this and you just are waiting because this is an expensive investment to get a guiding system, doing PPEC will definitely help you out, but for sure you should be able to get two minutes, maybe longer again, but that's all relative to your accuracy with polar alignment. Now, if you do recall, it does have an ST4 auto guiding port in here. If you go straight from the camera to the computer to the mount, it's gonna be way faster than going camera, mount, computer, mount, and then try to get your corrections. So ST4, I mean, use at your own risk. I, I don't do it. I, I shave off that one layer um, of communication, basically, that could cause error. Then you also saw the benefit of having all the cables inside. You can actually see there's a hole just inside the plate up here. Now, if you look, there's a hole right here. Just inside here are all of your cables that run through here. So it is incredibly nice having all of your cables run straight to the head of your Los Mandy here. That's going to swivel and so are your cables with your telescope. Now, one of the other features that was listed here is the spring-loaded 8-inch Vixen Los Mandy dual saddle plate here. Now, these screws are very heavy duty. They actually have real nice grips on them so you can tighten it down well. It's always giving you resistance, um, which is actually really nice because when you tighten it in, you can actually feel it really clamp onto the dovetail bar once you've locked it in, whether you're using a Los Mandy or a Vixen here. But these knobs are very heavy duty. Now, one thing to remember is with your EQ6R Pro, when you look at the head, one part of it is moving in and out. Whereas in here, it's only this piece here and this piece here that are moving in and out. It creates a pressure point that makes it really difficult for your payload to slide because you're putting more pressure on a smaller area and therefore it gets a better grip. So I really like this feature personally. Now just over here you do of course have your two DC 12 volt 3 amps. You have three USB 2.0 connectors and then you have another 12 volt you have another DC up here. So we could sit here and just talk about all the specs, right? You can read all those. Let me give you what's actually happening, what I'm experiencing myself. 
So on average, I really get anywhere from about a half a second to a full second of total error when I'm guiding with PHD2. I rarely ever let this mount track unguided except for maybe lunar and planetary viewing, but even then I never really ran into issues with this. This mount was spot on with regards to tracking um, the moon, Jupiter, Saturn, and multiple occasions of doing so. So at the end of the day, your guiding is really only going to be as good as your polar alignment. So with that, I do not use the iPolar feature inside of here. My biggest problem is it is accurate, yes, but to what degree is my personal question. Once, so I'll try to demonstrate this the next opportunity that I get, but what you'll do is you'll try to dial in the star. And so what it'll be is it'll be a red circle with a crosshair in it, and you're trying to chase Polaris or this point that it wants you to go to and once you get there it either it'll stay red or it'll go to green and once it goes to green that's that's as accurate as it gets but I don't know how accurate that actually is is that two seconds off is that two minutes off right there is a level of uncertainty when you use this so I personally have only used this when I know I don't need really good guiding so in that case, it's really going to be your planetary or your visual astronomy purposes. Otherwise, I truly stick to Nina's Polar Alignment plugin. It seems to be just a little bit more accurate because it does give you your specific altitude and azimuth errors. That way you can try to get that down to zero or as close to zero as possible. Now, I did find that as long as I was under about um, 0.13 seconds of total error, when doing my alignment, this mount did a great job. So again, it just boiled down to when you use the eye polar, it doesn't really tell you how off you still are, even if you're green. So from an astrophotography perspective, and again, I do 10 minutes and 20 minute long exposures. I don't have the ability to say, oh, well, I'm two minutes off. That'll be okay. That won't work, right? You truly need to be at, you know, 0.3 or less total error of accuracy every single night if you're doing that long of an exposure because otherwise, because otherwise your star's going to show it. So one big thing that I love about this mount is of course those readouts that I was talking to you about. You can see here on the side in nice big font and lines, you have a wonderful readout for your altitude, but then back here, I already showed this to you, you have a wonderful readout of how many seconds you need to turn left or right on the azimuth. When I'm doing my polar alignment, it actually really speeds me up because if it says I'm two, two seconds to the left, boom, I can just move my two seconds or you know however far it might be. It's going to let me know exactly how far I need to move. I truly wish that was a feature on all telescopes. And that's where you probably get into this mount being an entry to observatory grade, right? Not only can it handle a huge payload, not only is it heavy duty, um, but it does have a bunch of features built into the the head of the plate up here for the power. But then just these features when you do your alignment, they are small and you don't do polar alignment every time unless you're a portable astronomer, but it's a really nice feature to have. So let's talk next about the altitude really quick here. So there is one thing that I'm going to recommend that you pay very close attention to. So I use the key because I use the lever system, right? It's if you turn this by hand, you're not gonna be as precise as if you use a lever basically and you just do it this way. By extending, you're able to do a little bit more of a precise movement as opposed to trying to turn it by hand. So one of the key things with this, what I always recommend is go one way or the other. So you can see right here, there's a little bit of play inside of here. But if I push up a little bit or down a little bit, it engages the gear in the teeth to have pressure on them. That way, when you do put your payload up on top, it doesn't have any play where it could go down even just a fraction of a movement, losing your polar alignment. So I would personally, I would personally recommend pulling down to make the altitude go up as your very last movement. I always recommend starting low and then coming back up to where you need to be because it just it keeps that pressure on the teeth and gear and it allows for a little bit more accurate movements later and not lose your polar alignment in the process. So now let's just briefly talk about the usability of this telescope. 
Now, it is an entry-level observatory-grade mount. So what does that actually mean? Well, you can put it in an observatory, but it's only 30 pounds. You can actually make this a portable setup. At 30 pounds, yes, it is a little bit heavier. I will give you that absolutely. Now, if you decided you wanted to be portable maybe half of your time or less, this isn't a bad option. Now, you can really easily unbolt the actual head from the tripeer or the tripod, whichever way you go. Now, if you are going to be portable, I do recommend the tripod over the tripeer. The tripeer has less flexibility for adjusting for unlevel terrain. It does really well if you're within probably 90% flat ground, but it doesn't it doesn't allow you to extend the legs um, to really make sure that you, you're getting good balance. There is over here on this side gonna be a little um, leveler, a bubble level. That way you can make sure you're level. Now I have taken this out before. I've moved it around from the front of the house to the back of the house, and it does, it does take its toll. So I would caution you, if you're looking for a 100% portable mount, um, you know, if you're talking about something that you need a 70 pound payload for, this is probably going to be one of the lightest ones you're going to get. Now, if you're talking, you're only going to put maybe an edge eight, um, you could probably get away with something a little lighter. Now, just be careful though, right? This weighs less than an EQ6R Pro. So it depends on what type of weight you're prepared to carry. You know, this isn't a knock on anybody, but as you get older, you're probably not going to want to carry as much weight. I know I don't, and I'm only... 34. So it does present some travel opportunities for you, um, but I would caution you on the weight. Just make sure you're aware of 30 pounds, and that could very quickly become 60 pounds with this tripeer. And it, this thing is it's heavy, but it's also kind of awkward to carry with both head on and try to carry this tripeer at the same time. So I definitely recommend the tripod if you're going to be mobile. If you do want to just set up and forget, the Tripeer 100% is the way to go. It's bulky enough. It's going to hold exactly where it's at and it's not going to move. Now with this setup out of the box, brand new, you will have to download a few pieces of software if you purchase this again, brand new. If you were to purchase this from say me, you're already going to have the downloads to the latest. So just because it can hold 70 pounds doesn't mean you need to go putting 70 pounds on it, right? A general rule of thumb with astrophotography is to not use more than maybe two third of your mount's capacity. Now you might be thinking, well, you just told us you were using a 44 pound setup on your EQ6R Pro. Yes, I was. And I probably shouldn't have been, but I was able to do it because I made some modifications that allowed me to get the most out of it. So if you stick to the two thirds rule though, that puts the payload at about 46 pounds for this. So we'll just round that up to 50 pounds, right? 50 pounds of gear, that could be something like a um, an RC-10 maybe with a camera. It's going to give you a lot of flexibility, use much larger telescopes, and give you some wiggle room. Now, the reason why you don't want to use that full 70, though, is going to be simple. Now, you got to remember, if this mount is at its full capacity and the motors are always running at 100%, if they need to catch up to anything, they don't have the capacity to do it. They don't have extra torque to just speed it up real quick, right? It's going to be fighting. And if your polar alignment is not spot on, corrections may not be enough to fix your errors. So that's why they don't recommend you do more than maybe two thirds, right? You've always got some leeway. The mount always has some room to play catch up. And that's the key thing with these corrections. So you could maybe do 60 pounds and get away with it. But even 60 pounds is a lot of payload to put on a mount like this. Even though it can handle 70 pounds as a max, I wouldn't do more than probably 50. You can try 60 at your own risk, of course. Um, you might be able to get away with it, but it's all going to boil down to your balance and your polar alignment. If either of those are even marginally off, even 60 pounds is really going to struggle. Now, that is going to be specific to long exposure astrophotography. So we're talking 2, 3, 10 20 minute long exposures, right? Or maybe more. The reason why they allow you 70 pounds is because that's what it can move. But that's gonna be for like lunar or planetary. Maybe you can do it with planetary nebulae with say a planetary camera, right? You're doing more video than you are photography where a video is gonna allow you to have kind of that flex because some of those planetaries are incredibly bright. So when I move through here, I'm gonna talk about what things I like, right? I love that the RA and DEC both have labels to help speed up that polar alignment. Um, that's incredibly helpful. 
the mount's capacity has more than enough power to move just about any gear that you're going to put on it for astrophotography purposes and visual purposes. Um, there aren't too many scopes that are going to outweigh that that you're probably going to want to buy. You're talking probably 12 inches and greater are going to really start putting you on the cusp of this capabilities. So you are looking at really large telescopes, especially for visual, and you're still looking at pretty large telescopes even for astrophotography, right? A 10-inch telescope is rather large, and I'm going to demonstrate that here in just a minute. The next thing I like about this is the guiding. Um, again, I found the sweet spot is two and a half to three second guide intervals um, within PHD2, um, and I get excellent guiding. Any Again, anywhere from about a half a second to a full second of error just depends on the scene conditions, and again, polar alignment. If you're off even a little bit, that number is going to definitely go up. I have gotten as low as 0.2 for about a 30 minute span. So it can be done. It is all based on your seeing and your alignment. I also like the fact that this mount could be set up as a permanent rig. I mean, in the configuration I have it in, this is how you would set it up in a permanent rig. You could also do just a regular pier in the ground, um, but with a tri-pier, it's, it's incredibly steady. It's not going anywhere. But the other benefit is it can be portable if you need it to be. That is a lovely option to have, especially if you want to go look at something like Orion in a dark sky with a really large telescope and really zoom in um, on the trapezium, but you want to do it visually. This map can definitely do that. It can also do the photography route if you need. The other thing that I like is polar alignment is really held well with this particular setup. Um, if you spend the time, do it correctly, and you're going to leave it in a permanent location for a little while, um, that's excellent because I went almost four months and I didn't have to pull our line. The only reason why I had to pull our line at the end of four months is because I physically moved it to the front of the house and then put it back. I wouldn't have had to pull our line once in maybe a six month span because of how well it was held. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, you left the telescope on, you know, nothing really changed. It just, it moved a little bit, which if you lock it in place and everything like you're supposed to, shouldn't be a problem. That's not true. I removed multiple different types of telescopes, including this Newtonian, which sometimes it jostles the mount a little bit, um, didn't impact it. I had a flawless guiding, always under one second error for that entire four month span, whether I put on my 135 millimeter ASCAR wide field imaging or my 10 inch Newtonian at 44 pounds, it didn't matter. I was always having excellent guiding with this and it was because it was able to hold that polar alignment so well so this is a great setup for an observatory if you plan on leaving it there another thing that i really like is the fact that it has power ports in the actual plate up here that spins with the telescope that's so key you know the telescope's always moving but if you can have your wires match its movement that's such a nice feature to have if you're going portable and you just want to look at planets obviously having the eye polar is another positive you don't need anything special and it's free. It's built in. You just plug it in. You plug in a USB to, I think it's called like a printer cable, um, basically here in the back. And you just start dialing it in and off you go. It, it's super quick to do as well. It's, it's very accurate. I definitely recommend it'll take a picture and then it wants you to actually turn the mount. Do at least 45 degrees because that'll help you when you start doing your, your turns here with your azimuth. And also when you need to do lowering or raising with your altitude adjustments, um, it makes it a little easier to do about 45 degrees. That's hooked into my off-axis guider. This mount can really do anything that you need it to do. And that's such a big thing when it comes to the photography side. This can't all be positive, right? What are the dislikes? So I don't like the hand controller very much. Is there any other way to say that? Um, you do need to spend some time getting some education and practicing using the hand controller to be really good with it. There's some little things like, uh, for example, if you're doing lunar and then you want to readjust it and then you want it to sync, I, for some reason, it turns off the, uh, the lunar tracking for me and then I can no longer keep the moon in place. So the hand controller does require a little bit of education to be used to it. There's just some little things that I wish were uh, maybe a little more intuitive that just aren't. But overall, I really can't complain that much because I don't really use the hand controller all that much. But when I do, it's sometimes like, ugh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. So another dislike is, is while it is portable, it is still a little bulky to travel with. If you're gonna put this in your car and you aren't comfortable lifting even 30 pounds, make sure that you unbolt it from the head. 
That's the other thing that I dislike here. So instead of telling you how much I dislike this, why don't I just show you? You take your hex key, you put it in, and you do a turn. Well, you cannot turn it one full revolution. You can only do 180 degrees at a time. You have to turn this at least 30 times before that bolt comes out. It, it, that's a ballpark guess. But it's a lot of turning at only half. Well, the bad news is there's one on that side too. I wish there was a better mechanism to do the to do the attachments here that just, you know, make it really difficult. But I wish there was some sort of like a hand crank maybe. Maybe if they used a knob like this that could go right here that you could, you know, put your hex in and turn it as opposed to having to do this and then you only get a half a turn at a time. Um, it's kind of a pain to take this off and on, and that's why I recommend the tripod over this bulkier um, tripeer, because then you can just pick the tripod up. You don't have to take this off, but to be portable with a tripeer is very difficult. So the head of the mount is going to be free-floating. When you undo, say, your EQ6R Pro, right, and you turn this, there's tension. It, it stops in its place, but when you do this one, it will just fall every single time. There's no tension. Even if it's balanced, it can just spin, right? Like, let me just do this, I'm gonna flick it. Right, see, it's it's still, it's moving. And because of this free floating, sometimes your balance is difficult to get because it's kind of misleading sometimes, right? Since there's no tension, it's hard to say if you're close or not. You have to be spot on and make sure that that doesn't move. And I wish there was just a little bit of tension on them. Um, I think that would definitely help out, especially with newer astrophotographers. But they being the free floating, they're able to spin in any capacity. And again, if you don't lock this, this falling is going to be a heavy hit. So be very cautious of that. And I did say that at the beginning. This key will be in the side here. Once you remove it, make sure that this is in the lock position first, because otherwise, Sir Isaac Newton's going to take over your setup and it's going to make a really loud crash, or you might even pinch your finger. You could break your finger even with if this were to crush it. So. One other thing that I really wished was there's a lot of dew heaters that are USB powered. Um, the dew, the USB powers in the back here are not going to be actual powers. The USBs up here cannot be used with your dew straps. I've tried it. They, they just don't work. Um, I'm pretty sure that's going to be data only um, for those purposes. Now, another thing to remember here. There's a power down here in the back that goes for the actual mount. There's another power right here in the back of the head that is then to power up top. So you need two total power AC-DC converter power strips to make this mount work. It's one of those, I don't really like it scenarios, but at the same time, I get it. I understand why you need it. Um, but it would be really convenient if it was just one power supply for all of it. And so do know that you will need a second power supply to make this work. So let's talk about some final thoughts here, right? At first, I had issues with the software not working well, right? I did go into that a little bit, but I think it was just a combination of my specific mini PC and this. So I did get that worked out though once they released that update. Since then, I don't think I could be happier with this setup. I've absolutely had no problem since that update as well. So in conjunction with having a good scope and camera, this mount has actually given a ride to seven NASA APOD featured images in two ZWO Picture of the Week winners. Now, mounts are kind of like the unsung hero, so to speak. And then I said it before, when I first bought this, I would not have recommended this mount, but since that update came out, and since my experience has really improved, I've actually fallen in love with this mount. It has done a fantastic job. It's been absolutely incident free, but this mount has truly done every single thing that I've thrown at it. And again, whether you're doing visual astronomy or 20 minute long exposures with astrophotography, you really will have great results with this mount. Yes, factors like the eye polar accuracy do play in hand here. I wish there was maybe a little bit better accuracy with that. And that again is why I prefer Nina. It's going to get you the results you're looking for. The mount is a critical piece of astrophotography. So make sure you pick the right mount for you. But if you're asking my opinion, if you have a moderately large telescope, let's say maybe like an Edge 8 or greater, 
this mount should definitely be on your radar. It has the capacity to carry large telescopes with ease. So you can see this mount does this with ease. Again, this is a 10 inch Newtonian. So with that, I do recommend this mount. It is a, a great mount. I, you know, there's always gonna be some things that you wish it had that could make it just a little bit better. But um, in this particular case, there's nothing crazy that I would make a request of. Maybe just, again, a different mechanism for bolting this in and then, um, you know, a little tension up here. But I mean, otherwise we're talking minor things that um, are just nice to have at that point. This definitely works. Again, portable, permanent, whichever way you want to take it. Um, and you can use massive telescopes like this one here and uh, you can do it with ease. So again, thank you so much for joining. Be sure to go down in the comments below. Let me know what you liked in this video, but also if you are a Sim 70 owner yourself, let me know what your thoughts are. Let me know what things you don't like or, or that you've experienced that you think uh, they could have improved upon that maybe I missed. Otherwise, with that, clear skies. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time.